My name is Otisha, and I am Luis and Furious, uh, Luis and Narcy Furious's daughter. Although I was born in Shiraz, we moved to Tehran in 1964 to settle a barren piece of land southwest of Tehran on the plains of the Alborz mountain range. Luis and Narcy set about making the place Abad, which in Persian means to develop a piece of land, making it green and luscious. That is exactly what they did. It became known as Nowruz Abad. The Caspians entered our world in 1965 when Louise went looking for horses for her children to ride. Okay, for some reason, there we go. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Caspian as a historic perspective, showing you what the early years were like and how that influenced the spread of the breed afterwards. I'm going to talk to you about the Caspian horse and the peculiarities of the Caspian and what we need to keep in mind when we breed it, when we assess it, and when we judge it. I will then speak to you about the Caspian horse in Iran today. As you're probably familiar with the situation worldwide, I'll briefly talk about what I see as the issues facing the breed in the world today. And finally, I'll talk about the future of this breed. So when Louise set out looking for horses for her children to ride, she didn't go looking for a breed. And she didn't probably ever imagine the importance of the, that the search would come to signify. She was simply looking for a good, quiet, fairly reliable mount for her children and the growing number of friends' children that seemed to appear out of nowhere. The first Caspians were mainly stallions and they were selected as riding ponies. In those days in Iran, nobody gelded horses and mares were used in the breeding program. The success of the Caspian was immediate. Soon after their discovery, Caspian events were held regularly and pony classes were a part of all the quest major equestrian events, including flat racing. And when we weren't competing with them, they were our playmates. Games like hide and seek were simply adapted and to being played on horseback. Our very favorite game was racing up the river on the northern boundary of Norzabod. It was chest tight for the Caspians, so they had to jump to move upstream. Their wet backs were very slippery and it was difficult for our wet little legs to get any grip. Last person on was the winner. The Caspians were a success because they carved a place for themselves in the very lucrative show rings of, the, of Tehran's show circuit. In this slide, I'm going to show you how versatile the Caspian can be, from presentations involving mythical characters, to driving, to jumping, to work with handicapped children. In this slide here, you see a quadri, or a, what they call the reprise de manège, which is figures made by eight horses in an arena. This is a horse that was bred, it's a part bred Caspian that competed on the Belgian jumping circuit and that's my daughter, Leila. So evidence of a Caspian like horse has been dated to 4000 BC. Although this horse has definitely been around for much longer. This timeline is not to scale, but it gives a certain perspective on the last 50 years or so. If I were to have drawn it to scale, the events on the right side of the screen would be a dot. So let's move on to these events. In 1965, Louise and Narcy purchased their first Caspians and started the breeding program. That same year, Louise established a Caspian stud book with a foundation herd of five stallions and six mares. In the nine years after discovering her first Caspian, Louise reestablished what turned out to be an ancient breed, set up a national stud book, initiated exports, and helped 
form what was to become the International Caspian Stud Book. In 1973, the herd was nationalized and they were obliged to sell Norozovod. A few years later, Narsi and Louise moved to the Caspian, to the Turkmen steppes, sorry, and started their second herd. One year later, the second herd was nationalized. The following year was the start of the Islamic Revolution. The following year, Iraq invaded Iran and started an eight year war. At the end of the war, Louise was contacted by the Revolutionary Guards because they'd rounded up many horses during the war to be used on the front. They were now facing a big problem as they had to feed and stable these herds. We arrived to find hundreds of horses stabled or, at, or rather loose in, an, in, in huge enclosures surrounded by brick walls. They were totally wild. We were to select Caspian-like specimens, which were then to be caught by these soldiers. It was a very memorable day. And to make a long story short, that became the start of the third herd, which was called the Pony Company. This herd was sold four years later to the Jihad and became known as the Khojid herd. The following year, Louise started her last herd, which was known as the GTS herd. GTS signified Qarata which was the farm up in the Turkmen steppes. So why am I telling you all this? I want to stress the following. The events on the top of the timeline were not positive events. In the 40 years that Louise bred and raised Caspians, she had to start four different herds each time she had to find new foundation stock, establish bloodlines, and start a breeding program. The three nationalizations were detrimental to the breed rather than being a positive thing for the breed. Many Caspians were lost or died of hunger. No proper breeding program or stud book was ever established. In conclusion, the beginnings of the Caspian as a breed were extremely disruptive, with a war, a revolution, and nationalizations occurring on a regular basis. This is hardly an atmosphere conducive to setting up a breeding program for an endangered species. Yet, I am speaking to a group of enthusiasts and Caspian breeders from all over the world who are united by this horse, and that's extremely positive. So, what actually is a Caspian horse? Do we know what it is? Well, on paper we do. We have a very descriptive breed standard where we can tick off each characteristic one by one as we go down the list. But the reason I wanna to talk to you about this goes back to two different events that really opened my eyes in the last few years. I was asked to judge a Caspian breed show in Europe with two very well-known national judges. The entries filed in for the first class and the other two judges were discussing each horse as they paraded around. Once they'd gone through all the motions, they showed me their pit placings and handed the, their paper to the announcer. They'd indeed pick the best looking horses, the best confirmation, but not the best Caspians in my point, from my point of view. As the entries for the following class and came into the show ring, I said to them, there's only one Caspian in this class. Oh, they said, which one? You tell me, I answered. Well, they didn't pick the right one. But it turned into a very positive experience for everybody because we held a seminar after the show and talked about these issues. The second experience came during a trip to a breeder in Europe who had an almost perfect breeding operation on paper with all the major bloodlines present. But after a walk through the fields and the stables, I realized that there were very few phenotypically good Caspians in the herd. So Caspians 
are an ancient breed that are geographically located between the Alborz mountain range and the Caspian Sea. It's an agricultural area with rice and tea as the main crops, although other crops such as wheat, barley, cotton, citrus, and mulberry are also grown. Caspian horses are traditionally used to collect wood in the steep, rugged mountains of the Caspian until the rice paddies. They're kept in communal pastures called koroks and coexist with other breeds of horses in the region. They have survived through isolation and natural selection. These are some images of the koroks I was talking about, where different animals coexist in the same area. You can see cows, you can see dogs, <laughs> water buffalo, and other breeds of horses. There's another breed of small horse that also roams the Caspian Plains. Depending on where you are, the other breed of horse can be called a Yabu, which was how my mother referred to it, a Talishi, a Puseki, Pulaki. There are many ways to describe it. They're considered to be one breed although no extensive research has been carried out on them, to my knowledge. This slide depicts a yobu on the left, a Caspian mare found in a korok, those communal pastures, or in the mountains, and a Caspian stallion which has been bred and selected. They're similar. They have similar size. The tolishi or pulaki is a bit bigger and much coarser. They coexist in large herds in semi-wild con conditions, and they interbreed with the Caspian. Because these two breeds coexist in the same geographical area, they're often throwbacks to the Tolishi or Yabu type when breeding Caspians, even down the generations. It is really very important to understand this point so that you as a breeder can make corrections in the breeding program. These Talishi ponies are often excellent riding ponies and show many of the characteristics of the Caspian. They are phenotypically not Caspians. Louise was very well aware of this point, hence the very strict procedures for admitting horses as foundation stock. However, the ultimate responsibility always lies with the breeder. In September 2015, the fourth international conference of the Caspian horse was held in Rasht, in, which is basically the capital of the Gilan province of Caspian. It was a landmark occasion and it coincided with the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the Caspian. It was the first time an event of this sort was held in Iran and it showcased the work of the breeders, the pony clubs, and the research that was being done in Iran at the time. Some of the best scientists in the field presented their work as well, including Doug Anzat, Gus Cothran, Peter Dahl, and Phil Spunenberg, amongst others. I'm going to talk to you about the Caspian in Iran today. There we are. So the Islamic Republic of Iran is a very young country with new institutions. This situation has been very detrimental to Persian breeds, especially the Caspian. Since the passing of Louise, not a single horse has been registered until very recently. The Caspian Converse Conservation Society is now the official breed society of the Caspian horse in Iran. It was founded in 2018, two years ago. They have as their mission to, and I quote, preserve, protect, and help with the survival of the Caspian as a national treasure. They have carried out the mammoth task of conducting a census of all Caspian-like horses in Iran. These horses have been pre-assessed and put into various categories pending possible registration, as per the rules and regulations set out by Louise Fierus at the outset. Work on registration has begun, 
And the first horses have been entered into the ICSB, so the International Caspian Stud Book as well. They've also held their first breed show. 920 horses have been censused. Out of those 920, 325 had previously been registered during my mother's time. These were either foals or offspring of foundation or of registered horses. 259 horses have never been registered. 121 are foundation. The difference are what we consider Talishi or non-Caspians. This is an important number and I'll explain to you why. So these 259 have never been registered, but were found in the villages and the mountains. They are stunning specimens. Many of them are very high quality and they'd be a tremendous asset to future breeding programs. Estimates are that more than a thousand are still in the mountains and villages of the area. Closing a stud book would mean the loss of opportunity to add more Caspians to the genetic pool and to the overall population. It would also preclude 40% of the horses found in Iran today from the breeding program. So in order to enter into the Caspian stud book as a foundation stock, you need to be assessed by one international assessor and two, lo two national assessors. International assessment has been, has been taken, has taken part during two events. One was at the fourth International Conference of the Caspian Horse in 2015, and the second was in November 2019 at the first CCS breed show. The national assessors are Mohammad Tari Ibrahim Pur, Babak Shaki, Sina Zahir, Mehdi Bakhtiari, and Karen Firuz. There are two assessors that are also in training, and they're from the northern region of Iran. These, the first Caspian breed show took place in November of last year. It was organized by the Caspian Converse Conservation Society with a sponsorship of Partstead and the Jihad. Out of the dozen or so classes of the breed show, few had less than half a dozen entries. And what struck me most was the quality of the horses entered. There is no doubt in my mind that this little horse is well known and appreciated in its native country. And that great efforts are being made to preserve the breed. I've been returning to Iran on a regular basis for the past 10 years and I'm caught off guard every time by the quality of the horses. The dedication of the breeders and the tireless work of the equestrian community to recognize, honor, and preserve the work started by Louise Fierders in 1965. The oldest participant at this show was an 18-year-old mare by the name of Sarnevisht, which means destiny. She was rescued by a teacher in the village of Yamut, in Golistan province in the north of Iran. He's an elementary school teacher and teaches history, the history of Iran, and he uses the Caspian to teach, to teach the history of the Caspian area. Despite his difficult financial situation, he made the trip from his home in Yamut with two of his pupils all the way down to Tehran, sleeping on the side of the road, a trip of over 600 kilometers. If you look through the different slides, you can see some of the horses that were entered. Plus, you can see the local um, uh, clothes worn by the people of the Gilan province of Iran, which is where the Caspians are found. Attendees of the show were asked to write a letter to Louise Firuz, which would be delivered to a resting place in Karatapeshe, in the heart of the Turkoman steppes. The letters were assembled in an oversized envelope, you can see it here, and carried into the arena by two riders on their Caspians. 
One letter was to be drawn out of the envelope and the author of the letter would be presented with a Caspian from the parts stud. I had the privilege of drawing the letter out of the envelope and what caught my eye was this drawing. This was the author of the drawing and she went home with a little Caspian pony. A collection of stamps was also printed to honor Louise's work, uh, Louise's, Louise Fures's work on the Oriental horse. So the Caspian worldwide in 2020. Here's some salient facts about the, Cas about the situation of the Caspians today. Breeding populations are geographically isolated, making it very difficult to exchange genetic material. Breed societies are fractured. Caspians from Iran are isolated not only geographically, but politically as well. There is no access to any information regarding these horses and no exchange of genetic material or DNA for scientific research purposes. Dr. Farshad Malufi, a veterinarian who has worked on the Caspian for many years, compiled these two slides for a talk he gave in Semnan, Iran, a couple of years ago. So the data is from 2018. The graph charts the number of registrations per year. In the first graph, you can see a dramatic drop in the registration of Caspian horses since 2010 with only 15 registered worldwide in 2015. The second graph shows a number of registered horses categorized by age in 2018. These are very alarming figures and do not bode well for the future of the breed. I'd like to read the following excerpts taken from a paper Dr. Gus Cothran wrote for the fourth international conference of the Caspian horse. Clearly the Iranian, the Caspian horse from Iran harbors additional variation compared to those from the rest of the world. Recent DNA typing 100 Caspian horses from Iran showed that the Iranian diversity than Caspians from the rest of the world. All measures of genetic variation, variation showed values far higher than the non-Iranian horses. For rare breeds, the key concern is to minimize the rate of loss of genetic variability. The most important factor is the effective population size. This is basically the average number of individuals that contribute genes to the next generation. My, my mother once said, the quality of the breed should improve with each succeeding generation. This heritage has been bequeathed to Caspian breeders all around the world, and it is the responsibility of these breeders not only to preserve the breed, but to guard against hereditary faults and unprincipled dealers who would pass on defective animals as sound horses. Fellow owners and breeders of the Caspian, I gave you Equus fossilis orientalis persicus. You give me the perfect Caspian. That is a tall order indeed. And I don't think there is any way to do this without working together. When I'm not working with horses in one way or another, I'm a beekeeper. I'm always amazed by the wisdom of the hive and by their ability to make decisions involving the cooperation of up to 50,000 individuals. I think we could build on this wisdom to ensure that the breed interest supersedes all other interests. We must work together to ensure that we have a constructive approach that translates into a commitment to the long-term success of the breed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Attaché. That was very interesting history. Appreciate it. Um, 
I don't see any questions yet from our, our audience. If you would use the chat function, if you have questions, please do so. I would have a question for Atishe myself. Uh, looking into the future, uh, if you have a question, do it on the chat. Okay. One question that came up is, what do you mean by the nationalization of horses? Uh, it, in Iran, the nationalization of the horses took on two different uh, forms. Prior to the revolution, the horses were nationalized by what, by what was then the uh, Royal Horse Society, which was a governmental institution or a royal institution, as it was a monarchy in those days. And they took over the herd of the Caspians in the natural national interest of the country. So basically they buy the, the herd uh, at their price and um, you don't have a say in whether or not you agree. And that sounds like it was not a benefit to the Caspians. Um, it could have been out of benefit to the Caspian if we think to the Second World War, for instance, in Europe, a lot of national studs were, um, were set up after the Second World War because so many of the horses had been destroyed during the war. And that was an incredible event for the horse breeding industry because they basically conserved all of the major bloodlines and put them at the disposal of horse breeders. And that was the reconstruction of the modern sports horse. In Iran, it was not positive because they never thought through the program and they never actually um, set up any kind of um, a strategic plan to actually preserve the horse. Okay. Another question. With the current political situation in both the United States and Iran, uh, it, it probably is not possible to get DNA directly from Iran. Is there another pathway which we can find in an indirect way? Well, I think what's interesting right now is that the Caspian Conservation Society is actually taking DNA samples of every horse that they've census. So three DNA samples are taken. One is the property of the Caspian uh, Conservation Society. One goes to the lab for DNA testing, which would be parentage testing. And one is kept in a safe. Um, this data will be available to anybody who's interested. The idea is that it will be publicly available. Um, Right now, Iran has no ISAG approved laboratories, but they do have many laboratories that are uh, in, uh, capable of doing parentage testing. So it will be available. The problem is a political problem, and the problem is the isolation of Iran, both politically and, um, um, and geographically. But I think it won't be a problem in the future, and I think this data is preserved, actually. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, uh, the questioner is thanking you very much for your presentation and uh, beautiful presentation. She would like to hear, how do you, what's your th theory of training Caspians? Um, I, I'm, a, a, I'm not a Caspian breeder so much as a trainer and a rider and a horsewoman. So it's, the question I would be delighted to answer. Caspians are quick to learn. And what I tend to do is I always put a good rider on a Caspian at the beginning, because once the Caspian knows the basics, then they're very easy to use for children's ponies. But since they're very smart and learn quickly, they, le they learn good things and bad things very quickly. So I think it's really important to do the basic training of the Caspian before you put a child on it. And I always train them in all the disciplines. So I train them in dressage, jumping, and do a lot of outside work, pony games, et cetera. They're very versatile and they learn very quickly. But I think it's really important um, as a trainer to do that work and make sure that the horse is well-trained before any child goes on them. Um, thank you for that. Uh, the question on DNA, I think the, the questioner was referring more to uh, how can we get the genetics spread around from Iran that 
seems to be very potent to help the other areas of the world? I think that's a very good question. And I think it's a question we've grappled with for, since the beginning of the Caspian. And every time Caspians have been exported, it has been, you know, making, taking advantage of a situation that's come up. One time it was an ex seven ca export permits in exchange for seven visas to the UK. Other times um, there have been, you know, the, 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 there was just a, the opportunity that came up to get a Caspian on, on, a, on an airplane. Honestly, in today's world, I think we're probably facing the most difficult times in terms of sharing genetic um, uh, genetics or sharing Caspians or, sh or sharing semen simply because of the embargo on, on, on Iran, the sanctions and the embargo on Iran. So um, I just think we have to wait for better days on that one. Okay. An interesting question here. Um, when you were growing up, did you realize how special a Caspian was or did that come later? No, we didn't. They were just a part of our lives. As I imagine, ponies were a part of so many of our lives when we were growing up. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, this person has noticed a large number of horses in the U.S. that are not phenotypically Caspian. What do you recommend societies do to help with this? Um, I think that's a really good question. And I think we just have to be really aware of the fact that the Caspian is a local breed. A breed is a political institution. Genetics are biological. So when we come up with a breed, and when my mother established the Caspian breed, she was well aware of the fact that she could pick out horses and breed them together. And sometimes they would come out with, the offspring would come out looking like a perfect Caspian. Other times it would come out looking bigger, coarser, more towards Talishi or Yogu type. And I think if you keep that in mind, you will realize that the Caspian has mixed genetic blood because that's the way that they exist. They coexist with other breeds. So when, you're, when you have a breeding program and you have a horse that produces that kind of offspring, perhaps it's not a good idea to use it in the breeding program. I think it's, you have to be very, very selective in what you use. And I understand it's not always easy because of the relatively few numbers of bloodlines, but I think it's really important to keep that to, and take that into consideration when you do your crossing. Okay, um, that's answered uh, the questions, and I know it's a, it's probably a, 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 a large statement to use for a very specific problem. But I think it's really important to look at a Caspian carefully, look at their offspring carefully. Yes. Another question: Is there any type of handout or article going into more detail about the difference between? Caspians and non-Caspians, I think you call them Teleshi or Telushi. Yeah. The, the, would you, would no, you say there, there's a, would you say sorry. there's a uh, significant amount of Telushi horses in the I, ICSB now since we are a few generations removed from the regular assessment of third parties? I, I, I don't, I don't know if I would say that there, there's, uh, there are a lot of Telushis. But what I would say is that there will be throwbacks. And I think the onus is on the breeder to understand that. Or the, not the onus is on the breeder, but it is more the information should be out there that if you come, if you produce a horse that's a bit coarser, that has a bigger head, bigger ears, they tend to be coarser. They're larger in size. They have heavier bones. They probably have more feathering on the fetlocks, bigger ears. Those are probably uh, genes that have been within the, 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 the breed that are coming, that are being expressed later on down in the generations. And those are probably horses that shouldn't be used in a breeding program. That doesn't mean that there's Talishi blood. It just means that that is the nature of the Caspian. The Caspian is coexists with these other horses. I don't know if there's been any genetic uh, research done on these horses, but initially when the Caspian was first was first considered as a breed. A lot of uh, research was done on the size of the bones 
And there's definitely a difference between the bone size and de density between the two breeds. So there is a difference, but phenotypically there is a, uh, a difference. So the breeder can recognize that there is this problem in their program and then remove it from future generations. Okay, we're getting some very interesting questions here. Um, I'll see if I can phrase this so I think I understand it. Uh, how important do you think it is that Caspians are used to raise their profile, thereby creating awareness, interest, and demand versus straight breeding? Um, is it cat? Um, I. I, uh, and I notice it's from Team Hoja, and I think that's a brilliant question because I believe they have an incredible Caspian that's used in driving. And I think that one horse has probably raised more awareness than any other horse in the UK. And I think, you know, I talked about it earlier. I talked about the immediate success of Caspians in those early years. And the immediate success of Caspians was due 100% to the fact that these little animals would come into the show ring and perform. And they performed in flat racing, they performed as jumpers, they performed in three day events or one day events we had in those days. And they did well and they competed against horses. And for me, there is no question that if there is not a use for the horse in the show rings, the, the Caspian won't survive. It the, the Caspian will not survive simply as a horse that's bred by different breeders. There has to be a use to it afterwards. And I see that in my own, um, in my own lifetime in Belgium, I've had a few, uh, even though I'm not a breeder, I've had a few Caspians that I've used in the show ring and they were incredibly successful. So I, I think that there couldn't be a better statement from, from this person other than that that is the way to actually uh, preserve the breed. Okay. Another question. Uh, in one of your slides, you indicated that you saw no real Caspians except one. Could you elaborate? I'm sure we would all like better idea of what proper Caspian should be and look like. Um, so th th in this class, there were there were only four entries. So um, so I so it, it it probably sounded worse than it was. There were four entries that came into the class. One of them was a really good Caspian. It was a it was a Caspian. It was probably from a confirmation point of view inferior inferior to one of the other ones. That was a very nice looking pony or horse, but was probably phenotypically more towards the Tolishi type. So it was bigger, it was a bit coarser, um, but it was a really well-built pony. So they picked that one because as a national judge, they probably thought they were, or they, you know, you're, 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 you judge the best horse, but it was not a Caspian for me. And on paper, it was a Caspian, but I think it carried, you know, we talked to, I talked to you earlier about throwbacks to the Taolishi type. For me, it was a typical throwback to the Taolishi type. And it doesn't mean it wasn't a purebred Caspian because on paper it was, but I think in a breeding program, I wouldn't use that. So that's what I meant by um, that comment. And that's what got me to think that I see the difference because I grew up with the horses, but if you're a Caspian breeder that's never been to Iran, that's never seen a typical Caspian, you probably wouldn't pick up on that as easily as I would. And it's not a criticism in any way. It's just that I have seen many, many hundreds of Caspians. And another thing is, another point that I think is important to take into consideration. Um, Caspians in Iran live in a very rugged, in very rugged territory. They graze on what is available. They're fed, they're not fed extra food. So Caspians that come, that leave Iran and come to the luscious pastures of Europe and the US and are fed good food, they grow more. So they are, they have a tendency to be a bit bigger. So I think that when it comes to size, we have to be a bit careful, but when it comes to phenotype, that's where we can do a lot of work in the selection of our Caspians. 
And the phenotype of a Caspian is something that's very, very refined. Small ears, big eyes, uh, dense, but very fine bones, little feathering, etc. So that's where I think that you can see the difference because sometimes the size is a bit, um, a bit deceitful, if you will. Okay. Another kind of related question. Um, stallion licensing has been an issue that has caused division in this, in this country, especially given the uh, low availability of qualified inspections. Do you feel card grading would be a more effective method? Um, what I actually, you know, in, in, in the wild, the Caspian was uh, selected because the, the Caspians that had problems didn't survive simply. So when you create a breed and you put it into a situation where there's no natural selection, you have to have some kind of selection. What, call it whatever you want. I don't know if you want to call it stallion licensing, card grading. I think that that's a decision taken by breed societies, taken by experts. But there has to be some kind of a selection whereby horses with, de with genetic defects are removed from the breeding system. Okay. Uh, let me see. Is there a breed standard common to all Caspian organizations? I think there's a breed standard, whether it's common to all breed societies, I don't know. Um, I think uh, it's certainly widely available. Whether every breed society uses it or not, I can't answer that question. Okay. Um, we just have a few more minutes here. There is a question, let's see. What advice do you give to new breeders? fun. <laughs> you know, I think as a new breeder, I think it's really good to be open and to be constructive and to realize that it's a unusual breed. It's an endangered breed. And that I actually think it's very good also to, to have a lot of contacts with different people from different walks of life, different Caspian breeders and to talk to people about their different um, experiences. I've noticed some people have had problems with weight in Caspians. I know I've had that problem. Um, it, I live in Belgium and on a regular, on a normal year, which this year wasn't because we had a drought, there's a lot of rain and the grass is very green and it's very rich. And for Caspians, it's too rich. So we do have weight problems sometimes and we do have um, issues relating to overweight over, or, or horses being overweight. Other places might have different problems. As a new breeder, I think it's really important to take things like that into consideration, but also take into consideration that if you want to have a, a healthy breeding program, you need access to genetic material that is different from yours. I live in Belgium. The closest breeder is in the north of Holland. For me to get new genetic material, it's a big issue. So that I need to take into consideration before I start a breeding program. Uh, numbers are very, um, the Caspian numbers in Europe are going down. So if I want to start a breeding program, can I get new uh, blood into my program or not? These are considerations. Uh, I don't know where this person is from, but these, she should, or he should definitely look into that and take into take that into consideration before they start. Okay, good. Next question. Do you see a way that we can restructure internationally that would help unify everyone who loves these horses while preserving the bloodlines and breed standard? Oh, I do. I do. I think, <laughs> I think we should talk to each other and I think we should talk to each other and rely I feel very strongly about relying on science and and um, and uh, and the science of rare rare breeds and the science of genetics to take this forward. I know my mother was a firm believer in science, and she was a firm believer in getting people together. And uh, you know, if not, the Caspian would never be around the world. When you consider that one person uh, discovered a breed 50 years ago, and Today we're talking about 
uh, a worldwide breeding program. It's a, it's it, it's extraordinary, and I think that she um, she succeeded in doing that by being in contact with other, with everybody. And I think the first step is to actually get together all of us, uh, be it from Belgium, from the Netherlands, from Iran, or from the U.S., and come up with a breeding program where we're all participants and where we all own the process and where we all see the common goal, which is actually preserving the breed. I don't see any other way, Brian. I mean, I, yeah. I cannot understand that uh, we have more breed societies than Caspians almost. I mean, when you consider 15 Caspians were registered in the ICSB in, in 2018 or the last year, I forget what the last year that was recorded, that's almost fewer than breed societies. It's, 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 not, it's not a viable solution to the preservation of this breed. Okay, the last question actually was for me, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, in my introductory comments, I talked about my goal, personal goal for improving the Caspian breed was to get everyone under one umbrella. Uh, I don't have a plan for that. It's, it's just an ideal goal that I have. I have engaged nobody in the Caspian breed directly about this. It's just something that would be awfully good for the Caspian breed. So I'll answer that question in that way. 